Lord, we want to, again, very appreciative of Mary Litviak helping us out as our executive producer uh, every time we have a, a service. We just uh, finished with Major General Cecil Richardson, and he certainly appreciates Mary's ministry as well. And uh, today we're going to be hearing from him. He was actually scheduled March 22nd. We had planned him maybe six weeks in advance to speak. And then, of course, our last church service, March 15th. And I uh, really wasn't going to bother him, but I just thought I'm going to ask him and see. And uh, he said he was very grateful to be in involved, and we always appreciate the message that he'll be bringing later. Just wanted to start with a couple of announcements. Again, uh, we're grateful for people sending in their offerings here to the church. If you send it to PO Box 249 uh, in Lone Rock here, 53556, attention Pam, and I just passed them and opened along to her, and we're very grateful for your continued support of the ministry here. Martin Kleba Savo, 90 years old on June 19th. I really think they have the age wrong. I'm mean, gonna have to check with her. I can't believe she'll be uh, 90, but we'd encourage you when you send in your uh, offering, if you would also send a card, and I will make sure she gets it. Um, we're not sure when we'll be opening, what the future holds, but if you send her card to PO Box 249, uh, again, maybe attention bar, but I will make sure she gets the uh, card, and Mary had a great idea, 90 cards for 90 years. So that would be wonderful. Make sure they're home. Uh, no, <laughs> anyways, anyways, today we're very pleased to have Major General Cecil Richardson sharing uh, the scriptures with us today. We're very grateful for um, Major General Cecil Richardson, his wife, Dr. Janet Richardson, their commitment to our church, to the ministry here. Uh, they're always here to encourage uh, all of our friends and members here at the church. And we're just grateful that he's going to share this message with us today. Good morning, everyone. This is Cecil Richardson. If you don't know me, I'm uh, a member of the Lone Rock Community uh, Church. And I want to begin by thanking the pastor for allowing me to speak to the wonderful church uh, and to fill in for him today. Uh, he's a great, great guy and a dear friend. Let's bow our heads together and pray. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. And we ask for your blessings today that we might be a blessing to others. We ask that you would keep us strong, that we might help the weak, and keep us uplifted, that we might have words of encouragement for others. Give us spiritual vision, that we might see and understand the future, as it is much better with you than we could ever have anything that we could cling to here on this earth. And Father God, we pray today for our congregation and for our community. We pray for those who are facing a family crisis. We pray for those who are fearful, especially fearful of this horrible virus. We pray for those who are struggling with faith, that through a new, renewed trust in you, they can once again have a bounce in their step and joy in their heart. And Father, we pray for the entire troubled world and for the leaders of governments throughout the world. We ask that you would grant them wisdom to follow your ways and boldness to do what's right no matter what. We pray for our world's pastors that by your grace and through your Holy Spirit, they might bring hope in the face of despair and courage in the presence of hardship and peace in the midst of this COVID-19. And Father God, we humbly pray for ourselves that we might always trust in you and seek your kingdom above everything else. When fears assail and darkness overwhelm us, we pray that we'll always find ourselves safe in the arms of Jesus Christ. For we ask this in his holy name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 16, verses 1, verses 6 through 10. In fact, I'll just kind of wait a little minute uh, before I turn to 16 and start reading. Uh, the book of Acts was written by Luke. It was actually originally called a, a treatise on the Christian religion. But later on, when it was put in the Bible, and I believe the Bible will be the inspired and fallible word of God, don't misunderstand me. But when the treatise of Christian religion was put into the Bible, 
They put the first section of it and called it Luke and put it in with the Gospels. They took the second section and called it the Acts of the Apostles and put it following the Gospels. And so this is in the Acts of the Apostles, right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching in the preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, we, that is Paul with his traveling companions, Luke and Timothy and Silas, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. When I was a brand new military chaplain, I was stationed in my first assignment at Little Rock Air Force Base in Arkansas. And in the chapel, a uh, young uh, C-130 pilot accepted Christ as his savior. And he was getting ready to go overseas uh, to be stationed there, and he wanted me to baptize him before he left. Now, I baptized by immersion, adult baptism by immersion, uh, but the chapel didn't have a baptismal tank. Most chapels don't. And so I called an off-base church pretty close to the base, and I told them who I was, and I asked if there was any chance that I could use their baptismal tank. Well, the pastor was really excited. He said, oh yeah, of course, you know, come on. In fact, why don't you preach in our Sunday evening service, and we'll have the baptism after that, and then you bring a bunch of people from the chapel if you want to, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring our congregation, and we'll have an ice cream social after the baptism. Well, the day of the baptism came, and I had already counseled the young man. I explained the meaning of baptism. I had prayed with them. But I had failed to explain to him exactly how an adult baptism by immersion works. I just assumed that he would know that, but he didn't. That day I preached the sermon and then I went down into the baptistry, that is water about this deep. And of course it was filled with ice cubes. Every time I do a baptism at a, at a civilian church, it seems like they put ice cubes in it, or it seemed that way anyway, it was bitter cold. And I was down there and I was, I, I, I was holding my Bible and I read the scriptures uh, from the book of Acts and the book of Romans, and a deacon was holding the microphone for, from, for me, and I explained about this young man accepting Christ and his commitment to Christ, and then I turned to him and I beckoned for him to come join me. Well, he had never seen a baptism before, and so he just folded his hands and dove in. Well, the water just erupted up around me. It knocked my glasses off, it ruined my Bible, and the people in the congregation looked at it and thought, the military does it different, but then they saw the look on my face and they burst into laughter, in fact, almost rolling in the aisles laughter. And the young man came up and, and shook the water off his face and looked at me and realized what had, gone, what had happened. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, well, chaplain, I guess it's time for plan B. Well, I wanna to talk to you about plan B this morning. The Bible says that God has a plan for our lives. I call it plan A. It's a good plan, a wonderful plan. It's a plan based on his love for us. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, the Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and plans to give you a future. God's plan in the Bible is clear. His plan is that we be saved, that we have eternal life in Christ and that we spend eternity in heaven. Second Peter chapter three, Verse 9 says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible also says that it's God's plan that we have life abundant. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. The Bible says that God wants us to have a good marriage that he wants our children to grow in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, that God wants us to prosper and be in good health, even as our soul prospers. That's Bible truth. That's plan A. That's God's plan for your life and God's plan for mine. But the tragic truth is that we live in a fallen world. Pastor Peach mentioned this a few weeks ago. 
Sometimes Christians don't prosper. Sometimes we're not in good health. Sometimes our marriages are not what they're supposed to be. Sometimes we're not the people that we should be. Sometimes we miss the plan of God for our lives. And often, not always, but often, the reason we miss it is that we choose, consciously choose, plan B rather than plan A. Plan B is God's second best, not his perfect best. Plan B is God's permissive will, not his perfect will. Plan B is like a kiss from your sister. It just doesn't have the pizzazz. Plan B is like going to the nicest steakhouse in all of Spring Green and ordering a hot dog. Plan B is like needing to lose 50 pounds and deciding to just get a haircut instead. In our scripture reading this morning from Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul was confronted with the possibility of a plan B. He was in the middle of the second missionary journey. He and his three friends had visited the churches in Galatia that they had started on the first missionary journey. They visited them and then they were looking at going on on the second journey to new and unexplored places. They wanted to go into Asia, what we today, Asia Minor, what we would call Turkey. But in Acts chapter 16, verse 6, it says the Holy Spirit kept them from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit telling a preacher not to preach? I heard a story once about a rich man who went to his pastor and said, Pastor, I want to do something really special for you. My wife and I decided that you need a vacation, and so, so we're going to give you a three-month, you and your family, a three-month, all-expense-paid vacation. You just take off, and then when you get back, I'm going to have a very special surprise for you. So the pastor, being no dummy, he, he gathered his family together, and they took off for three months to have a wonderful vacation. All along, one, the pastor was wondering, what's the surprise? What's the surprise? And he came back, and, and uh, the rich man met him and took him to the church, but the old church was gone. There was a brand new church there. I mean, a beautiful, big, brand new church. The finest money could buy. And the pastor just said, wonderful, marvelous. And they walked inside, and the pastor, everywhere he looked, he said, wonderful, marvelous, wonderful, marvelous. But there was only one thing wrong, he thought. There was only one pew. And the pastor said, what is this? There's just one pew. And the rich guy said, just wait till Sunday morning, and you'll be surprised. So on Sunday morning, the people filed into the church and they filled up the pew. And as soon as the first pew was filled, it moved itself all the way to the front and another pew popped up. And that one spilled and it moved to the front. And the pastor just said, wonderful, marvelous, wonderful, marvelous. And the pastor got up to preach and he preached like he had never preached before. He was just so excited. He preached on and on and on. And 12 o'clock hit. The clock just turned 12. And suddenly a trap door opened underneath the pulpit, and boom, the pastor went on down. And all the people stood, and they said, wonderful, marvelous, wonderful, marvelous. <laughs> well, the Holy Spirit kept Paul from preaching in Asia Minor. And in verse 7 of Acts chapter 16, it says that Paul decided that he would just go to Bithynia. Bithynia was the hub of Asia. It was a rich, highly populated area. It was the center of culture. It was the apex of education. It was in Bithynia that later on, years later, the Emperor Constantine created Constantinople, which became eventually, of course, Istanbul. Americans call it Istanbul. I lived there for a few years. It's actually pronounced Istanbul. In the natural, Istanbul was the perfect place to preach the gospel. Paul could have created the largest church in Asia Minor. He could have had a huge staff of full-time church workers. He could have had a praise band and an orchestra and a paid soloist and a monster pipe organ. Paul could have designed a Christian amusement park with water slides and condominiums and a TV station and a glass cathedral and a full-scale model of Noah's Ark. But in verse 7 it said, The Spirit of Jesus would not let him go to Bithynia. Can you imagine that? The Spirit of Jesus not letting Paul go to the most fertile mission field in the entire world. Instead, if you look at verse 8, it says, they went down to Troas. 
you could actually say that they went down to Troas. <laughs> There's a lot of symbolism in that, 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 those words because Troas was a bummer of a place. I've been there too. Sounds like I'm dropping names, but <laughs> I just traveled all over the world as a military chaplain. It, it, Troas is a little bitty city by the Aegean Sea. It's not a city, it's a little town. It's right where Europe meets Asia. In the days of Paul, Troas was a wretched, poverty-stricken fisherman's village with narrow streets and filth, and the air reeked with the stench of dead fish. But it was in Troas that Paul learned plan A. It was in Troas that Paul learned God's plan and God's purpose and God's will for his life. It was in Troas, in a vision, that Paul saw a man from Macedonia saying, come over, come over and help us. And immediately Paul and his three friends took off to Macedonia. Let me share with you this morning very quickly the formula that Paul used to find plan A for his life. It's a formula we can use in our lives too. First of all, Paul believed that God had a plan for his life. Whether it was in Asia Minor or Bethany or Troas, it didn't make any difference. Paul believed that God had a plan. And friends, you'll never find God's plan until you realize that there is a plan. I want you to know that God has a plan for your life, whether you're 20, whether you're 40, whether you're 80, whether you're a male or female, God has a plan for your life, whether you're talented or totally untalented. God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose. He has a reason for your being on this earth. Some of you have had a close call in your lives. Maybe you've been desperately ill, or maybe you were in a car accident, or almost in a car accident, and you were huffing and puffing, and you say to yourself, and maybe to others around you, you said, oh, God must have left me here for some reason. But let me ask you, have you ever, have you ever asked yourself why God left you here? Or more importantly, have you ever asked God why he left you here? If not, today would be a good time to just ask him. Just say, God, what is the purpose of my life here on earth? So first of all, Paul believed that there was a plan. Secondly, Paul waited until the plan became clear. Paul was at the height of his missionary career, but he was in Troas, and he was at a standstill. His entire missionary organization was turning to him and saying, Paul, where do you go next? What do we do? What do we do? But Paul would not move until he heard from God. He had been told not to preach in the most fertile mission fields imaginable. He had bypassed the most popular place on earth. He had missed an opportunity to pastor a huge church. He was biding his time in a stinking little fishing village. But friends, if you wait on God, you'll never be disappointed. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In Troas, Paul learned the priceless lesson, lesson of waiting on God. It was in Troas that Paul tuned his spiritual ears to God's plan. And you might be wondering what God is doing in your life. It might seem to you like God doesn't have a clue who you are or what you're going through, but that's not true. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And here's my final point. Paul found the answer in the darkness. I know that might sound like a strange way to say it, but that's what happened. The Bible says in verse 9 of Acts chapter 16, during the night, Paul had a vision. See, you don't have a vision at night. You have dreams at night. You have a vision when you're awake. So apparently Paul was awake at night, praying and seeking God, and God used that dark time to speak to him. God uses dark times to speak to us too. Sometimes God has to get us away from the TV or the computer or the video games or the busyness of work. Sometimes he has to even put us on our back just so he can talk to us and tell us about plan A. It took an all-night wrestling match with God to switch Jacob from plan B to plan A. It took a lonely cave and a bold prophet to turn King David's heart from plan B to plan A. It took a filthy pigsty and a hungry stomach to turn the prodigal son from plan B to plan A. God's plan A for Paul was that he'd go to Macedonia. And I'm sure that Paul was disappointed. It didn't come with a promotion. God says, Paul, Paul, I want you in Macedonia. So Paul went to Macedonia. The Bible says that he and his friends went down to the river and they met with a group of people and they told them about Jesus. 
And one of the people said, hey, let's have a Bible study. And from that Bible study, the church in Europe was born. Now hear me now, this is important. Whenever historians and church scholars discuss the life of Paul and the history of Christianity, they all agree on one thing. They agree that the most important thing the Apostle Paul ever did was to go over to Macedonia. Why? Because centuries later, the Muslims swept across that area, they took Constantinople and all of Asia, and yet Christianity was saved. Christianity was not overrun because Paul had planted the gospel in Europe, because Paul had obeyed the voice of the Lord, because Paul had chosen plan A, even though he didn't have a clue what God was doing. As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I lovingly invite you this morning to choose plan A in your life. How do you do it? Well, first by accepting Christ. If you haven't done that, nothing else really matters. Secondly, by submitting yourself totally and completely to God's will. Tell God that you want His best for your life. Give Him full control of your life. Thirdly, if you want plan A, ask God to show you His plan for your life. And fourthly, follow God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. In the Christian allegory, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Pilgrim was got a, had gotten to a point where he was, he was just in total darkness. He was disoriented. He didn't know what was going on around him. And he, he was looking for the celestial city that is a kind of a euphemism for God. And he met this man named Evangelist, and he begged Evangelist to show me how to get to the celestial city. And Evangelist said, do you see yonder wicked gate? And Pilgrim said, I don't see anything. I don't see anything at all. It's just darkness. And the evangelist said, well, do you see yonder shining light? And Pilgrim says, well, not really. I see one area that's not quite as dark as everything else. And the evangelist said, well, then walk toward that light area. And the closer you get, the more clear it will be, and you will find the gate to the celestial city. And my friends, my message to you today is keep walking toward the light of God. Even when it's hard to see, even when it's dim and you just can't quite make it up, keep following God. Just keep on following Jesus. Keep marching onward to Zion. God's plan, God's aid, will become brighter and clearer the closer you get to Jesus. And you will find yourself walking in the center of God's will for your life. Let's bow our heads together and pray. Father God, there are a lot of voices in this world. There are a lot of opinions, there are a lot of directions we could go. As a church and individuals, however, we want to follow your plan. We want your will. We want to follow you. Father God, we choose plan A. And today we recommit ourselves to following you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with all of you, both now and forever. Amen.